Good morning. Well, yeah, good morning. You know, there was a lot of noise on that first Easter Sunday. More than that. I thought I'd, uh, in honor of our African friends this morning, I thought I'd put my African suit on. Okay, some would say this is tribal and presented to like a king figure. Others, others think it's a pair, a pair of pajamas, but you'll get over it. I just felt really free to be able to wear it this morning. But no, um, having, having um, had uh, Watoda Choir staying with us and experiencing them over the last few years, there's just such a joy and a freedom about what they carry. And uh, I wanted to express that joy and freedom this morning in, uh, in uh, what I was wearing. So, the greatest day in history... I remember singing that song a number of years ago, that greatest day in history. I hope, um, I'm going to pray now, that I hope that my words, I mean, can't even, become cl- can't even come close to doing it justice. But in the midst of these next few minutes, that God will really speak uh, into our lives. So let's pray together. Father, we come here this morning, 2,000 years on, to celebrate for the greatest day in history. And Holy Spirit, we ask you that in these next few minutes, you would work around this room. You would bring revelation, understanding, a growing, a deepening. You would bring healing, all because you are alive. And we pray to the glory of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle are dead. Julius Caesar, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Adolf Hitler are dead. Cleopatra, Florence Nightingale are dead. Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, and Charles Darwin are dead. Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad are dead. Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein are dead. Albert, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill John F. Kennedy are dead. They were all alive, very much alive, but they are all now dead. What we come to do this morning is to celebrate, and as Tim has already mentioned, now in the light of something that took place 2,000 years ago, we celebrate that Jesus was dead, but now is very much alive. So what? Because what we're doing this morning is not celebrating, in a sense, the fact of an empty tomb. We are celebrating the why of the empty tomb. And I hope in the next few minutes that that will become a bit of a revelation for us. We've got our first reading this morning from John chapter 20, verses 1 to 9. And it says this, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, whilst it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. I love the little bit of the humor there. It's like, ha, faster than you. Outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture 
that he must rise from the dead. They didn't yet understand that he must rise from the dead. You know, even the most skeptical, cynical, and unbelieving historians, philosophers, and theologians agree that a man named Jesus died on a Roman cross on Friday and was later buried, and that on the Sunday, the tomb was empty. Historians, most historians around the world understand those facts. But what does it mean for us today? What does it mean for people over 2,000 years throughout, the, throughout time? Because Jesus, his crucifixion, as was so beautifully laid out on Friday when Kirsty spoke... Jesus' crucifixion wasn't something new in terms of the culture. Thousands of people had been crucified and buried. But when we get to Easter Sunday, we have one tomb that is empty. Why? Today is not an attempt to defend the resurrection. Okay, it's not an attempt to defend the resurrection. To defend the resurrection. Today is about understanding the significance, i.e. the why, why the grave is empty. We know he loves us. Why is it important for the body to have been raised? You know, it's very easy within Christianity, within church, to have the, the, our predominant focus on the death of Christ. We understand, you see, in culture, we understand to a large degree death. We understand, understand people's sacrificial gifts and acts of kindness. And at the cross, we see a life sacrificially laid down. Why? Because he has loved and continues to love all of mankind. And yet, we struggle, I think, to understand in the same context and with the same certainty the resurrection. Maybe because it's a little bit more outside our understanding. We can understand somebody dying on a cross, giving up their likes, life, sacrificing, showing us the extent of their love. But unless we understand the resurrection, unless we understand that God raised Jesus from the dead... And that he was actually raised, his death on the cross really has no significance. It's like the end, it's the crux of the matter is the resurrection. You know, here I have, I have a torch, which uh, if I click it on, it works. There's a, there's a negative and there's a positive terminal to that torch. I can try all I like to hook up the bulb to the negative terminal and expect power. And although the battery is there, it's not delivering the power. I can try all I like to, to just connect it to the positive terminal, but try all I like, it will not bring power to the bulb. It requires both within the context of the battery. And I think for us to understand the importance and what was achieved at over the Easter period is to understand that the death and the resurrection of Christ are so vitally important for us to understand that they go hand in hand. Just like one plus one equals two, the death plus the resurrection equals eternal life, equals hope equals healing and all the rest of it. If we park our minds on what took place and, so, and solely think about the love of God as displayed on a cross, we are missing, we are missing the very fact that God raised him. For God so loved the world and often our thoughts go to the cross. I want to encourage you this morning to think about for God so loved the world, that he raised his son, that we might live in the reality of what he has brought. 
that we might live in the possibility of healing, that we might live in the reality of his presence every day. We've been going through this amazing series. I hope you found it really useful called Ancient Roots, where we've been taking a look at the Apostles' Creed and on those, as it were, those anchor stones of what it means to be a Christian, understanding our heritage and understanding what we believe. And we get to the phrase in the Apostles' Creed this morning, which says, On the third day he rose again from the dead. So what? On the third day, he rose again from the dead. I want to, I'm going to bring up our next scripture. I want to make three points this morning from this resurrection. Point one, the gospel is true. The gospel is true. The death and the resurrection means that the good news is true. The resurrection enables the fulfillment of the good news. For without the resurrection, the good news doesn't really exist. There is a sacrifice of an awesome man on a cross laid in a tomb. But without the resurrection, it's not complete. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 6. In the message version this morning, I just think it highlights beautifully What is taking place here? Friends, let me go over the message with you one final time. This message that I proclaimed and that you made your own, this message on which you took your stand and by which your life has been saved, I'm assuming now that your belief was the real thing and not a passing fancy and that you're in this for good and holding fast. The first thing I did was place before you What was placed so emphatically before me that the Messiah died for our sins. Exactly as scripture tells it. That he was buried, that he was raised from death on the third day. Again, exactly as scripture says. That he presented himself alive to Peter, then to his closest followers, And later to more than 500 of his followers, all all at the same time. Most of them still around, although a few have since died. The resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus proves that the gospel is true. There There is no power without it. We've sung about resurrection power. But I want to encourage us to really take a hold of the understanding and the enormity that the resurrection brings. Why is it? Why is it that the empty tomb isn't the symbol that we hang round our necks? Why has it become the cross? Now, obviously, I'm not I'm not taking away from the power of the cross for salvation, for the forgiveness of sins. But without the resurrection, it's incomplete. I want us to take a hold. I want us to go away from this morning to be as certain of, to be understanding of the power and the nature of God to complete the story through the resurrection. That it's like his full stop on the story. It's the climax of the story Because it is so vitally important that we understand and that we live in the joy of the resurrection. The gospel depends on it. It's good news. You see, without the resurrection, is it really good news? It's not, is it? It's not the complete good news. It doesn't lack the power. One may may be inspired by the life of Jesus by what he did and laying down his life. But when we understand and we grab a hold of and we live in the light of resurrection, it's like the story comes to life. All that he told us, all that he lined us up for, the promises throughout Scripture suddenly become attainable and real because the same 
power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives in you and I. Anybody remotely excited by that reality, by that truth? But it's an anchor we need to hold on to. So maybe, here's, here's a little thought, maybe the next time you're considering buying a gift for a loved one, maybe you want to buy them, a, get, get, a, get an empty tomb specially made rather than the cross, or have them side by side, even better. The fullness of the extent of the love of God for us. You see, if Christ did not, wasn't raised from the dead, we have a massive problem. If Christ isn't raised from the dead, we have a serious problem. There ain't no point in being here. Because the gospel, the good news, isn't complete. It ends short. It's terminated at the cross. But the good news is that he was raised to life. Because if we don't understand the power of that, we may, all be, we may as well be on the golf course. Okay, maybe not many of you play golf. <laughs> maybe, maybe fishing. Maybe somewhere else, just going for a walk on the beach. Skiing. Some of you, oh, you're really Christian, you guys. Because <laughs> it doesn't make sense, does it? What Christ has done through being raised from the dead is overcome for us, has given to us that which we could not do for ourselves. Christ displayed the magnitude, the enormity of his love by being crucified on a cross for our sins. Then on Good Sunday, what is effectively given to us through the resurrection is the life and the power to live out all that he's promised, the fulfillment, it's the whole story We can rely on the truth of the gospel. So the resurrection encourages us, teaches us, helps us to understand that all that Jesus prepped us for, all that he taught is true. Secondly, death is defeated. Death is defeated. Romans 6 verses 5 to 9 says this, For if we have been united with him in death, like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. This, this is hugely important for us to understand that the resurrection of Christ helps us to understand, gives us the power, the reality that death, this final frontier, has once and for all been defeated, stamped into the ground, has no power anymore over us. Do we get it? But here's the reality. Death in our society and in our culture still holds us with fear. It's the fear of the unknown. It's the fear that this is all there is. Jesus, in being raised to life, overcame what sin rightfully did for us. Sin in our lives brings death. Now all of us, here's a 100% guarantee, money back guarantee. Every one of us, 100% of us is going to terminate. We are all in this room, all of us are going to die. That's for certain. At some point, okay, 
dead cert. Back that one if you like. If It's a dead cert. We're all going to die. But how are we approaching it? What about our loved ones, family members, work colleagues? What is our fear for them? What are their thoughts about death? It's this final frontier that we, we approach with such fear and trepidation. You know, as a pastor, I get the amazing privilege to stand by and to walk alongside people who are mourning the death of a loved one. And I see the joys in that process, and I see the incredible heartache of people in that journey who are longing, who are hoping that their loved one might be going somewhere that's better than here. They have no assurance, no certainty of what death has brought to their loved one. In the resurrection, what Christ does for us is he says, all the fear that surrounds death, all the penalty that is encompassed in sin and death has been left at the grave. My resurrection means that you have no need to fear. You see, the grave couldn't hold him. The power of sin and death couldn't hold him anymore. God raised him to new life. So that in Christ, not in sin, but in Christ, we need not fear death any longer. Grab a hold of that. To know that you can stand at death's door knowing that he's got an eternity ready for you. It's not just the passing of a physical body. It's that all our sin has already been dealt with. We have no need to fear death in any way, shape, or form. That excites me because it means I am relying on Jesus day in, day out, no matter what may come my way. And my desire for my family and friends is that they might know the certainty of what Christ has achieved. There may be people here this morning that you may be wondering, what is this Jesus malarkey all about? Why is it that 2,000 years later, people still gather in, in rooms, in places, in open air, all around the world to celebrate this person whom we can't see anymore? The church of Jesus Christ is growing around the world. It's growing not because he's dead. It's growing because he's alive. His name isn't written in that prolegue of people's names and then they're dead. The church is growing because he is alive. Why was it or how was it that these frightened disciples on Friday, having watched their Savior be crucified, not understanding the fullness of the scripture, were terrified they met in an upper room. Why was it? How did Acts happen? We know that the Holy Spirit came. But what was it? Who came and stood amongst them? Suddenly, in the midst of their fear, in the midst of their hurt, in the midst of their shattered dreams... Because they'd hoped so much, they'd pinned, they loved his teaching, they saw his miraculous signs. They'd hoped, they'd wondered, and yet Jesus was crucified. They didn't fully understand the enormity of what he was doing. But in that moment, here he is. Our hopes, our dreams are suddenly reawakened. Yes, he has overcome the power of death. The grave couldn't hold him. All that he promised. all, uh, And they started to begin to remember the things he had told them. And their lives, you know, all but one of the disciples went, were killed. And some of them in horrendous situations. Do you think if they hadn't actually seen Jesus being raised from the dead, that it, ah, well... Um, you know, I know all the others said, well, you know, just so that you spare my life. Well, no, he didn't really rise. No, they lived because all that he had taught was now living in them. The gift of the Holy Spirit living in them because he was raised to life. 
death now no longer had a hold over them. And thirdly, 1 Peter 1 verses 3 to 5 says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. How? Living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Wow, what a promise for everyone who understands, who believes, who confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that he has been raised to life. What an amazing promise. We get the beginnings of a living hope here on earth. But it's the preamble to what's yet to come. He empowers us. He equips us to live life now. But it's not just for the here and now. He's empowering us to live for what's yet to come. There's a down payment. There's a, there is a promise. There is a chair with your name on it. 2,000 years Jesus has been preparing and is preparing a place for you. Look at me, people. The significance of the resurrection is vitally important for us. Jesus was bodily resurrected. Not some notional idea, or wouldn't it be good just to believe that? No, he was miraculously raised to life in order that he might pass on to us out of his mercy, the full inheritance. Can you get it? The full inheritance of what God has for you. There are people in this world who are craving the inheritance that their parents or some rich uncle or aunt can pass on to them. Let me assure you that will fade into insignificance compared to the greatness of what God has already done and is preparing for you. But part of that comes with the understanding of the power of the resurrection. Because it's through that, through the joy of knowing he's alive, that we begin to walk into that. Dr. Greenleaf. Interesting name, Dr. Greenleaf. The Royal Professor of Law at Harvard University one of the greatest legal minds that ever lived. He wrote the famous legal volume entitled A Treatise on the Law of Evidence. Considered by many the greatest legal volume ever written, Dr. Simon Greenleaf believed the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a hoax. And he determined once and for all to expose the myth of the resurrection. After thoroughly examining the evidence for the resurrection, Dr. Greenleaf came to the exact opposite conclusion. He wrote a book entitled An Examination of the Testimony of the Four Evangelists by the Rules of Evidence Administered in the Courts of Justice, in which he emphatically stated it was impossible that the apostles could have persisted in affirming the truths they had narrated had not Jesus Christ actually risen from the dead. He concluded that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the best supported event in all of history. He committed his life to Christ. My dad died tragically a number of years ago. But you know, the memory of him lives on in my mind. But I can't speak to him as much as I'd like to, as much as I crave that as a son. I can't. All I have is the memory of him, which is awesome. But what we need to understand is that what Christ has given us What the Father has given us through the resurrection is not a memory of a man who died on a cross. It's a living relationship 
with him here and now. That's the difference between my memory of my dad and a relationship with a living Savior. Do you know what Scripture says? He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding now. Right now, he's praying for each of us, presenting us before the Father. I want to encourage you this morning. If you've never really understood the power of the resurrection, not understood maybe the full message of the gospel, because the full message of the gospel is death plus resurrection equals life and all that he promised. Maybe for you this morning, there's a sudden dawning, a revelation, a wake-up call that this Jesus really is who he said he is, not was, is. Why is the church growing around the world? Because he's alive. He speaks to us, works with us, empowers us, inspires us, and gives us life. We'll have an opportunity in a minute, and Tim will lead us in that, to maybe respond to that call to follow Jesus. But first, let's worship God as a response.